Hi, welcome to the next in our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the input impedance of transmission lines. And it turns out, in fact, that we're almost done with some of the basic mathematics and understanding we need to be able to do a lot with transmission lines. So let's get uh, some of these last pieces put together. So what do we know so far? We know we have a transmission line that has a phase velocity and a what we call a characteristic impedance, Z naught. Um, we've attached to the end of this transmission line, line a load of some type, has a load impedance, Z sub L. And this can be uh, real, it can be complex, you don't have to hook anything there at all, in which case you have an open circuit, and we've seen that last time. We also know that we have two waves that are counter-propagating, one wave going in the positive direction, one wave going in the negative direction. Um, we also have waves for current, and we know that uh, when we have these waves, they create a standing wave um, on the line so that the voltage is going to vary across the line. Um, we know that the, uh, the characteristic impedance of the line is just the ratio of the voltage on the line to the current on the line, and it, it has to do with the, the inductance and capacitance per unit length. If we know those things, we can calculate that. We also relate those to the phase velocity. We know the propagation coefficient is also related to the phase velocity. So really, if we're given the phase velocity, if we're given the impedance, and we're given the frequency, um, or omega being 2 pi times the frequency that we're operating at, we've got everything we need to do to do a lot of calculations, um, assuming we know the load impedance. Um, we also know that the negative going wave and the positive going wave are related by the reflection coefficient which is just a function of the, the characteristic impedance of the line, Z naught, and the load impedance, ZL. And so this is all review. We've learned this up to date. But there's a little bit of a complication, something we haven't quite figured out yet. And maybe you've been wondering about this, and that's the following. Um, if the voltage, V sub Z, varies, and the current, I sub Z, vary along the line, um, does that mean the impedance varies along the line as well? Uh, well, the answer would seem to be no, because we're defining the impedance of the line by Z naught, what we call the characteristic impedance. So, so, so what's going on here? And, and in fact, it's true that the voltage and current do vary along the line. They vary as these standing waves. And so you have to understand that the characteristic impedance is the impedance of a line that's not connected to anything at the end. Let's say an infinite line where the signal never reaches the end then the voltage and current are going to depend on the characteristic impedance. But as soon as we put something on the end of the line and send that reflected wave back, then we've got a spatially varying impedance. Um, so how do we deal with this? Um, well, we deal with it mathematically, like we do most things in engineering. Uh, it turns out that, that this is fairly simple to do. We can just write the spatially varying impedance, Z of Z, as the, the voltage over position on the line and the current over position on the line, we, we have our standard wave equations that we put here, so we can calculate that. Um, we can simplify this uh, quite a bit if we realize that for every V naught minus here, we can replace those V naught minuses with a rho V naught plus. And then another thing we're going to do to make the algebra simple is we're going to multiply this by this term right here, e to the plus beta z. And what that's going to do is, is this term, of course, is equal to 1, and we're always allowed to multiply by 1. But that's going to basically knock those terms out and double those terms right there. And when we do these things and we do the algebra, we come up with an equation that looks like this. The, the impedance on the line as a function of d which is, is our position, is equal to this equation. And we've made a few slight changes here because we realize that, that 0, the point z equals 0, is defined to be at the load, remember. That's where we arbitrarily define to be z equals 0. So when we get down here, z is equal to negative d. But I've already taken care of that in this equation. So now we're just assuming this d is a negative d. We don't have to put in a negative number because that's already taken care of in this equation. Um, well, that's great, because now we know what the input impedance of the line is. Uh, it looks like a pretty nasty expression, because we realize that the, uh, the reflection coefficient here actually can be a complex number. We're multiplying it by another phase constant. 
But in these days, with MATLABs and computers and, and pretty powerful calculators, this really isn't that much of a problem. This is really fairly straightforward to do. I personally just code everything in MATLAB, which makes it doubly easy. And so we can find the input impedance of any section of line, or, or by using the equation above here, um, the equation at any value of d. d doesn't have to be at the input. And so now we've really got everything practically we need to to have to work with transmission lines in a very real sense. And so let's see how that works. Um, if we know the impedance, we know the phase velocity, and we know the impedance of the load, z sub l, and we know how long our line is, we can actually calculate the voltage and the signal we're, we're um, providing to this load if we knew v naught plus. We, we don't actually know what the voltage that we're sending out on this line in the first place is. Um, it's, you sort of have been assumed that we're going to give it to you, but how do you calculate it? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, what we do is we know the input impedance of the line at point D, given by the equation we just figured out before. And so all we do is we slap a generator on the line, and we know that any kind of generator um, not only is, is a voltage source, but it has some characteristic impedance Z sub G, Z sub G being the generator impedance. Okay, so let's just write generator there. And so this is pretty straightforward. If we have a, a supply voltage or generating voltage VG with a impedance Z sub G, this is pretty straightforward to calculate because here's what we do. We basically just take our load impedance, um, we take the load impedance, calculate the reflection coefficient, we know beta, we know the length of our line, we know the impedance of our line. With all of that, we plug in and get Z sub D at the input of the line. And so Z of D is actually the input impedance right here. Now we have a voltage source, a generator impedance, and an input impedance. This is a simple voltage divider, and this one's pretty easy to do. So we know V naught plus is equal to the input impedance over z sub g plus z sub n. And we have everything we need to be able to actually solve what the voltage delivered to the load is and calculate the signals and emission lines. Now, now this has been a really high level overview. and We've touched on a lot of things, but with the equations we have, we're pretty good at calculating a lot of problems. So let's take a look now at a, a more complicated problem, more complicated than we've seen so far, and see how we would deal with it. Now, I'm not going to give you numbers, and I'm not going to solve the problem, but this will give you the techniques to be able to deal with it. So here we go. This is one of the classic problems that professors give to students to see if they really understand what's going on. Because when you see this, you're like, oh my god, it's a Y-shaped transmission line. Um, we've never studied Y-shaped transmission lines. What am I supposed to do with it? Well, well, let's take a look at this. Um, if we want to know what the actual voltage is on load impedance number one over here and load impedance number two over here are, we've got to figure out what the voltages are. And so we're probably going to start, um, oh gee, how do we start with this thing? And here's the trick. Write it up here. With transmission line problems, work backwards. That's what you have to do. You always start at the load and work your way toward the generator. So we know what this load impedance is, check. We know on this line, we're calling line one what the impedance is, and we know the distance. So essentially what we're going to do is, at this point in the circuit, we're simply going to calculate Z in one. Because we can work and find the input impedance at this point right here by working backwards this way. We can also do that with Z in two. We know the load impedance, we know the line impedance, we know the length. We work our way backwards, and we find the input impedance, Z in 2, at this same point, right here. Now we have two impedances in parallel. Well, we know the expression for two impedances in parallel, right? And so, um, basically, 1 over Z, uh, let's call this, 
what should we call this? Z parallel maybe is equal to 1 over Z in 1 plus 1 over Z in 2. These, of course, being complex numbers, so the math gets a little hairy if you're doing it by hand. But we can calculate this parallel impedance. And so essentially what we have here is now we've got Z sub P. We work our way backwards. We find the input impedance. We find V naught plus. At this point, we do some, some things that because we know at this point we've got some voltage V naught plus. This is going to drive two currents through these lines. We know those currents for each side. And now we can work our way backwards having the voltage at this point and the currents in the line and actually find what is driving these two loads right here. So that's a much more complicated problem. It's a classic one on a test. And again, what you do is you work your way backwards, making equivalent circuits at each point in time, and just applying voltage divider rules or something simple like that. Hopefully this explains things. All we have left to cover is power, um, because signals aren't power. And then we'll essentially be done with the transmission line, besides a few examples.